not the absence of fear, but the willingness to confront it and all through persistence, we discover the power within us to overcome any challenge. This year, be determined to join the League of Home Owners and take advantage of the Adam Homes property listings as we journey with you to overcome looming challenges with our flexible payment plans and affordable product offerings. Stand your ground. Become a homeowner today. Subscribe to Adron Homes. Building cities, communities, and homes. commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight at Wawodo. Hello and welcome tonight. Former governor of Kogi State escapes EFCC dragnet after hours of siege laid to his Abuja residence by operatives of the anti-corruption agency as two courts issue conflicting orders on his arrest. Kano State High Court affirms the suspension of former Governor Abdullahi Ganduje as APC National Chairman of the party's leadership dismisses Ganduje's suspension, threatens legal action against those it claims are imposters. And supporters of PDP National Chairman Omaru Damagum protest in Abuja against demand for his resignation. PDP governors say Damagum's fate will be decided by the National Executive Committee. Now on business news tonight, the Central Bank of Nigeria reduces loan to deposit ratio for banks from 65% to 50%. For about nine hours, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC, today laid siege to the premises of the former governor of Kogi State, Yahya Bailo, in a bid to arrest him over alleged misappropriation of funds to the tune of 80. 4 billion Nara. The officials of the EFCC who arrived at the residence of the former governor at about 9 a.m. were prevented from arresting Mr. Bello by police operatives attached to the former governor. According to the EFCC, Mr. Bello was eventually whisked away by governor's successor, Governor Usman Ododo, from his residence. Our correspondent Victoria Longjan reports on the drama that played out. Benghazi Street at Wuse Zone 4 in the Federal Capital Territory was today cordoned off by armed operatives of the EFCC who laid siege as early as 9 o'clock this morning to arrest the former governor of Kogi State, Yahaya Bello. <laughs> Loyalists and aides of the former governor, including police officers, are seen mounting a resistance, forcing operatives of the EFCC to mount watch a few meters away. Moments later, more supporters and loyalists to Yahaya Bello arrive in show of solidarity. However, the former governor remains locked inside his residence. With the EFCC still mountain watch, hours later, the current governor of Kogi State, Usman Ododo, arrives to the cheer of supporters. Yeah. 
Our attempts to speak with the EFCC team lead proved abortive, but some supporters of the former governor were quite assertive, alleging witch hunt. It's clear already that it, it is the whole thing is politically motivated as it is now. You can see it. Every normal human being can interpret what is happening now. The former governor just paid a visit to Mr. President just a day before yesterday. And today, this attack came. It's clear. You can read it. You can read within the line. I am not sure those guys are from uh, EFCC because there is a substituting court order. I am sure they have regard for rule of law. And I don't think uh, they are above the law. So I have, I have my doubt. I have my reservation. Maybe they are not from EFCC. <laughs> Finally, Governor Usman Dodo departs the premises after about five hours of the EFCC officials' wait. A little while later, the EFCC officials also depart. It's been seven hours since the operatives of the EFCC laid siege here at the premises of the former governor of Kogi State, Mr. Yahaya Bello. The EFCC operatives have now left the premises without the uh, former governor in their custody. Meanwhile, there are several court documents that have emerged. While the High Court in Lokoja has issued a restraining order on the EFCC as it concerns arresting the former governor, a federal High Court in Abuja has granted the EFCC an arrest warrant for the former governor preparatory to his arraignment. Victoria Longjun for Channels Television News. And while the drama to arrest Mr. Yahya Bailo was unfolding in Abuja, attention shifted to the courts in Kogi State and the nation's capital, which issued conflicting orders regarding the arrest of the former governor. First, a high court sitting in Lokoja, the Kogi State capital, issued an order restraining the EFCC from arresting, detaining or prosecuting the former governor. The order followed a suit by the former governor seeking to enforce his fundamental rights against the EFCC. In a two-hour ruling delivered on the High Court 4, the State Court equally restrained the EFCC from continuing to persecute the applicant after dismissing the issue of jurisdiction as challenged by the EFCC. However, shortly after the Kogi High Court order, the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja granted the Anti-Corruption Agency permission to arrest Mr. Bailo, preparatory to his arraignment tomorrow, Thursday, April the 18th. Justice Emeka Mwite granted the warrant after the EFCC Council, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Rotemio Yedepo, approached the court on an ex parte application in which the EFCC asked the Justice Mwite for an order granting leave to the EFCC to effect service of the charge together with a proof of evidence on the defendant by substituted means. In the meantime, the former governor is now faulting the siege on his Abuja home, despite a subsistent court order restraining the EFCC from arresting him. According to a statement released by the former governor's media office, the EFCC was duly served with that order on February the 12th, 2024. But the commission subsequently filed an appeal on February the 26th, 2024, and the matter is still pending in court. While calling on President Bola Tinubu to call the EFCC to order. The media office maintains that it is a surprise that the agency led by a lawyer could fragrantly disobey a subsisting court order by taking actions contrary to the reliefs granted. In the same vein, a group, the Coalition of Democracy and Justice, is asking the EFCC to desist from what they describe as degenerating the nation's judiciary through an attempt to effect the arrest of the former governor. Addressing a news conference in Abuja, the convener of the group, Mr. Ojo Lukayode, says the action of the anti-graft agency is capable of threatening democracy and the rule of law. Now it is important that we advise the EFCC not to make itself susceptible to any action that might be deemed as violating the sanctity of the judiciary. They must ignore the antics of all those who are urging them to commit content of court through disregarding an outstanding court order against the arrest of the former governor Yaya Dosabedo or any of his aides pending determination of the case in court. 
that regard, as instituted by the lawyers of the former governor. The rule of law is lifeblood of democracy. Therefore, we all the LGC to always to the part of legality in carrying out its mandate. The Commission must deliberately avoid the temptation of falling under the pressure of disgruntled political elements but by breaking the law in their actions to uphold the law. All of those concerned must follow the due process of law by abiding by subsisting by abiding with subsisting court orders. We do sincerely hope that the EFCC, as a law abiding agency, will see through the poorly veiled ignoble actions of those undesirable political elements and refuse to act illegally. But our optimism may be short lived as in vagrant disregard to that court order which the Commission has appealed and pending for hearing on May 22nd, April 2024. The EFC may be in the process of effecting the illegal arrest of the former governor. If this happens, it will be a sad day for democracy and the EFCC will have succeeded in turning itself into a law-breaking commission. Meanwhile, some senior advocates of Nigeria have been providing insights into EFCC's actions today. According to human rights lawyer, Mr. Femi Falano, it is untenable the allegation made by the former governor of Kogi State that the EFCC disobeyed a court order by attempting to arrest him to answer 84 billion Nara fraud charge. He notes that this is legally indefensible because the former governor has lost his immunity from arrest and prosecution as no court can confer life immunity on a former governor in Nigeria. He maintains that the police, anti-graft agencies and other prosecutorial bodies cannot be prevented by a court of law from arresting a criminal suspect once there is reasonable suspicion that he or she has committed a criminal offence. He adds that the police officers who prevented the EFCC from arresting the suspect have committed a grave criminal offence, calling on the Inspector General of Police to withdraw the said police officers from the private residence of Mr. Bello without any delay. Meanwhile, another senior advocate of Nigeria, Kayo De Adeluola, has frowned on the act of issuance of court warrants and counter orders by the federal and state courts. The Leonard Silk explains that the state judge should know that the federal government agency can only be sued at the federal court. He spoke on our political program, Politics Today. I believe that anyone who has gone through uh, some legal training would know at what point in time his authority um, is, is being exceeded, whether as a legal practitioner or as a judge. If a matter is brought before a judge, what he needs to look at are two major things, the parties and the subject matter in the claim brought before him. If a high court judge saw that the AFCC was a defendant, it simply should have simply should have told the parties that I will not be able to handle this matter, take it to the federal high court. But then again, the defendant, well, the, the claimant in this situation, so you hire Bilo, uh, was a governor only until the man I was speaking yesterday. So, you know, you understand what I mean by that. So the, the, the judge felt, probably felt he had a responsibility to him. It's not right. We should not allow our, uh, our jurisprudence to go to the dogs. We know when we have no authority. The concern is very clear. A federal government agency can only be sued at the federal high court. So we should, as lawyers, whether senior advocate or not, and as judges also, look at these matters carefully so that we do not act as though we're ignorant of these things. It's just not right. We cannot have um, an injunction restraining a legitimate body from prosecuting you forever and ever. It should not happen. It will not happen. 
Meanwhile, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission has released a press statement saying that it will no longer tolerate obstruction of its operations. It warned members of the public that it is criminal offence to obstruct officers of the commission from carrying out their lawful duties. According to the statement, Section 82 and 2AB of the EFCC Establishment Act makes it an offence to prevent officers of the commission from carrying out their lawful duties, and they have said the culprits risk a jail term of not less than five years. This warning has become necessary against the backdrop of the increasing tendency of bypassings and groups under investigation by the Commission to take laws into their hands by recruiting thugs to obstruct lawful operations by the EFCC. Still staying with the judiciary, popular Instagram celebrity Pascal Okechuku, also known as Kubana Chief Priest, has been granted bail in the sum of 10 million naira after pleading not guilty to three count charge for allegedly spraying and tampering with a naira note at a social event, contrary to the provisions of the Central Bank Act of 2007. After being arraigned at the Federal High Court, Ikoi, his lawyer, senior advocate of Nigeria, Chika Sulu Ojuku, asked the court to admit his client to bail, which the EFCC counsel, Bilikisu Buhari, did not. Justice Kane De Ogundari subsequently admitted him to bail in the sum of 10 million naira with two responsible sureties in like sum each before adjourning the matter till May the 2nd, 2024. The court said they must be gainfully employed with the federal or state government and must not be less than grade level 16 officers. They're also to have landed properties within the jurisdiction of the court and the documents of the property must be verified by the prosecution and the court. The bail conditions must be perfected within seven days, but in the meantime, he was released to his lawyer who must give an undertaking to produce him in court for his trial failure of which will cause him to be remanded in a correctional facility. Meanwhile, the defendant, who was also ordered to submit his international passport to the custody of the court, informed the court of his pending application to challenge his jurisdiction to hear the charge. In part two after the break, Kano State High Court affirms the suspension of former Governor Abdullahi Ganduje as APC National Chairman. Party's leadership dismisses Ganduje's suspension, threatens legal action against those who claims are imposters. It hurts. It's human to feel pain. Ease the pain with Isidol for fast relief from pains and fever. Isidol comes in easy to swallow caplets for adults and suspension for children. Isidol, ease the pain, a product of May and Baker. If symptoms persist after two days, please see your doctor. Nivea Pearl and Beauty deodorant. With natural pearl extracts and avocado oils for soft, smooth and beautiful underarms. The perfect balance of 48-hour protection and care with delicate fragrances. Feel the power of pearls. Nivea Pearl and Beauty for soft, smooth, and beautiful underarms. Try our new Pearl and Beauty Black Pearl for smooth and perfumed underarms. Now, all of us like to chop better food. Food where they make body tracker and vegetables where fresh like see tomorrow not day. We want to make the chocolate sweet the way we go like them. No cubes. Let it be the secret. Then make them with correct ingredients like chicken, parsley, garlic, plenty iron kung fu and palm to make your chocolate palm bar for you. Come the sweet well well. Let it be the cocoa. Make we carry salute. Throw away give no. Change your world by changing what in day you play it. The future belongs to the dreamers, to the doers, to those who are not afraid of the side hustle. It's for those who are ready to turn their passion into something big and to help keep you revitalized and inspired. Talk Tees with you every step of the way. You are made for more. Find your inspiration. Talk Tea. Big round bags of flavor. Today. 
for the most fair price for you. In drive, people driven. Oh no! After a party, Binta needs a safe ride. Binta, get in drive and choose rides by driver's rating, car, and time of arrival. In drive, people driven. We all know the feeling, hanging out with friends, and reaching for that refreshing bottle of soda. <laughs> but hold on a minute. What we don't always see is what's hidden inside those bottles. So when you reach for that bottle, can, or juice box, remember, it's not just a drink. It's a threat to your health. Abuja will on May the 20th, 2024, rule on an application to transfer Namdi Kanu, the leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, from the custody of the Department of State Services, the DSS. Mr. Kanu's counsel, Aloy Ejimako, is seeking either house arrest or placement in another law enforcement agency's custody for Mr. Kanu. The hearing will continue as Justice Nyako reviews arguments on this matter. Our correspondent, Emanuela Ekele, reports of alleged treasonable felony instituted against him by the federal government. Mm -hmm. He's received by family members and the clergy. <laughs> At the resumed hearing, a lawyer, Ejimako Namdikano's counsel, argued against his continued detention by the DSS, claiming it would hinder the court's accelerated hearing order. He cited precedents like Sambo Dosuki and Elzakzaki. However, the prosecution's counsel, Adeboyega Womolo, urged the court to dismiss the application, stating that defendants cannot dictate prosecution terms. He deemed the bare restoration request an abuse of court process, suggesting appeal to the Court of Appeal instead. Awomolo asserted that DSS custody ensures Kanu's safety, refuting claims of lawyers' access hindrance. Ejimako opposed starting the trial at DSS facilities, arguing for a more suitable environment to prepare Kanu. We have not had any opportunity. We have made this very clear. It is not about having access to our client. We do have access, but our access is monitored, hampered to the point that we are unable to discuss with him within this, that zone of confidentiality that is guaranteed between a lawyer and his client and that enhances the defense we shall prepare to properly defend him against charges that carry the death penalty. A House of Representatives member who was also in court appealed to President Bola Tinubu to end the trial by ensuring out-of-court settlement. At this juncture, I will continue to call on the president to exercise his constitutional power and then issue knowledge through the attorney general so that we can bring this thing to an end and open the door for reconciliation and peace building in the southeast. The trial judge, Justice Bintanyako, adjourned the case to May 20th for ruling on the two applications. Emanuela Ekele, Channels Television News. The anticipated arraignment of the national chairman of the All Progressives Congress, the APC, Dr. Abdullahi Omar Ganduje, has been installed due to the Kano state government's inability to serve criminal charges against him. 
Mr. Ganduje, alongside his wife, Hafsad Ganduje, his son, Omar Abdullahi Umar, and five others, was later to face eight counts charges, including a $413,000 bribery allegation and the diversion and misappropriation of funds amounting to 1.38 billion naira. In a courtroom session, counsel to the Kano State Government informed the court of their failure to serve the respondents personally, thereby halting the proceedings. The presiding judge, Justice Naaba, adjourned the matter till the 29th of April 2024 for further proceedings. Meanwhile, the Kano State High Court has affirmed the suspension of the former governor, Abdullahi Ganduje, as the national chairman of the All Progressives Congress, the APC. Justice Usman Naaba granted the order in response to an expert motion filed by the two executive members of the APC from the Ganduje Ward, Lamin Usani and Haladu Gwanjo, alleging breaches of party regulations. The court's ruling mandates Mr. Ganduje to seize all activities associated with his position as the national chairman of the APC, effectively halting his involvement in the affairs of the National Working Committee. Meanwhile, the national chairman of the All Progressives Congress, the APC, Mr. Blahiganduje, has been speaking on his suspension as a national chairman of the party, insisting that those who announced his suspension are sponsored by the ruling New Nigeria People's Party in Kano State. Addressing a delegation of APC members from Kano State, led by the state chairman, along with the executives of Mr. Ganduje's wards in Dawakin Tofa, local government area in Kano State, he described those who announced the suspension as imposters who will be made to face the wrath of the law. Senior party officials from Kano State are here for a solidarity visit with the national chairman of the party, Abdullahi Ganduje following his alleged suspension from the party by some members at his ward level. This delegation is led by the state chairman of the party, in the company of the party's governorship candidate in the 2023 election, as well as the ward chairman of the Dawakin Tour for local government area. We're given us this opportunity. Speaking on behalf of the delegation, the state chairman of the party tells the national chairman that he has their support. Your Excellency, in our meetings, um, the chairman and members of the working to fire executives of APC and Ganduja Ward chairman and his uh, management team. They are here for a solidarity visit. So they are here to tell us all that the information going around is not the true situation on the ground. The national chairman expresses his gratitude to the delegation who are charged to remain committed to the unity of the party. Mr. Ganduje tells them that the APC has commenced legal action against imposters parading themselves as members of the party. You are complaining that you have disassociated yourself from that false claim. And in addition to that, you are appealing to us. We take appropriate legal action according to the rule of law. This new destruction should be checked by the security agencies and even the judiciary. On Monday this week, some members of the APC from his ward in Dawakin Tofu local government area of Kanu State announced that Mr. Ganduje's membership has been suspended. According to them, this action stemmed from corruption allegations, including bribery, leveled against him by the Kano state government. Well, we have more on politics. We head over to Abuja Studios now, where Gloria Mezoke is standing by to give us more on the news at 10. Hello, Gloria. Hello, Anne. Many thanks. Here in Abuja, we begin with the question of whether or not Mr. Umar Damagum, the acting national chairman of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, will remain in office. The PDP Governor's Forum says it will leave that to the National Executive Committee to decide his fate and other constitutional issues impacting the party's unity. The recent agitations, including protests within the PDP, have seen some members demanding the resignation of the National Working Committee owing to alleged mismanagement of the party. Six state governors and two deputies arrived separately at the Akwaibon State Governor's Lodge in Abuja for a closed-door meeting. 
the meeting is coming barely 24 hours to the PDP National Executive Committee meeting, which has been slated for Thursday, the 18th of April, to discuss, among other matters, some of the leadership issues that have rocked the party in recent times. Earlier in the day, protesters had occupied the national headquarters of the party, displaying placards with solidarity messages for the acting national chairman of the party and the minister of the federal capital territory, Mr. Nyesum Wike. Wike has carried this party for a very long time, sponsoring the party, uh, financing the party, all alone. So I think Wike has to be the leader of this party. That's what we are saying. As you can see, we are not done as we are supporting him hundred percent, and we also endorse Damagun as the national chairman of PDP. However, the PDP governors, after a closed-door meeting in Abuja, affirmed that the National Executive Committee of the party will resolve the leadership issues and all the constitutional matters affecting the PDP. I know the governors normally take the leadership position, but we have an acting person in capacity, in a, a acting capacity leading the, the party, and so a neck will decide whether it is time to take the acting uh, to, to fill in the vacancy. Looking at the legal implication of doing that, knowing that there are so many lingering litigation issues in court and of course we don't want to disparage ourselves because we are aware there are some marauders hiding somewhere trying to factionalize our party and take one person to go and do coalition we are not going to allow that as governors the PDP is facing a leadership crisis with members calling for the resignation of the Damagum-led National Working Committee. Meetings like that of the National Executive Committee and the party's board of trustees have been arranged to address these issues. We're still ahead on the news at 10. The Central... for hash to get started powered by first bank for an exclusive three times skin effect try Nivea Men deep powered by black carbon for 48 hour deep moisture a fresh skin feel and a long lasting masculine fragrance make an impact with Nivea Men deep impact body lotion try Nivea Men deep roll on for 72 hour antibacterial sweat protection Hello, this is Premium Pension. How can we help? Our experts work behind the scenes, enabling our members grow wealth to secure a premium tomorrow. We see your hard work, and we make your money work hard for you. We are growing with you. In commitment and service, Leveraging technology to meet your demands. Secure your future and pave way for the next generation. Embracing diversity with firm roots across the 36 states of Nigeria and the FCT. Premium pension. Active today, premium tomorrow.
enjoy the delicious creamy goodness of cowbells. With Vitarich and vitamin B9, which supports brain development. Cowbell, so creamy, so good. The Duchess International Hospital caters to every aspect of a family's health needs. A one-stop shop for maternity and child health services, emergency medicine and critical care, medical and surgical subspecialties, dental and eye care, and a range of other subspecialties and services, all available at a single location right here in the heart of Kedja. And it really doesn't matter if you're paying out of pocket using your HMO or private insurance. We focus completely on providing that world-class affordable healthcare for all the family at all times. Welcome back as you're watching the news at 10, coming to you live on Channels Television. A governorship aspirant in Ondu State under the platform of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Senator Jimo Ibrahim has some encouraging words for the youths of the state. He is promising that if he becomes governor, he would empower the youths to be self-reliant in order to contribute their quota to the development of the state. Senator Ibrahim made this promise while addressing the gathering at the APC Asheori Youth Conference in Akure, the state capital. Youths from the 18 local government areas of Ondo State and the 203 wards in the state gather in Akure, the state capital. APC! <laughs> The reason for the gathering is the APC Asheyori Youth Conference, put together by youths in Asheyori Movement, a political group created by Senator Jimo Ibrahim. We will sit down and shut out this master plan. With the theme, investing in human capital for innovative and sustainable economic development, the creator of the Asheyori Movement, Senator Jimo Ibrahim, promises the youths that if elected as governor of Ondo State, he will bring innovation that will empower them to be self-reliant. When I become governor of the state, I'm going to make sure that children, women, and young persons are the immediate dashboard of that government. We need, we need it. We also need to open the type of revenue. You cannot develop a state if you don't open the type of revenue. Next, the chairman of Asheyori Movement, Mr. Omotayo Alashu Adura, appeals to the youths to support Senator Ibrahim because he has what it takes to transform Ondo State. Senator Jimmy Ibrahim had come. He had said he wanted to take care of party members because of the suffering we had gone through in the almost eight years of APC in this state. That's why the fact that we were APC. That money that was given is not what you would gain in his administration. What you are expected to gain is leadership. Other political leaders present add their voices as they urge the youths to support the aspiration of Senator Ibrahim. As soon as the election is won on November 16, he will put a committee together who will actually work on the roadmap to progress in the state. The sun shall shine again in on the state. When Timor Ibrahim come on board, the solution of on the state will begin immediately. When you go out, tell others, Timor Ibrahim is the solution. One of the youths moves the motion for the adoption of Senator Jimo Ibrahim as the next governor of Ondo State. The president is sending out a warning to those threatening the country's sovereignty that they will not go free. 
He said this during a meeting with the Pan Yoruba Social Political Group, Afeni Fere, at the presidential villa in Abuja. Our State House correspondent, Emperor Simon, reports that the Afeni Fere leaders also urged President Tinubu to consider restructuring the command structure of the federal security agencies for equitable representation. President Bola Tinubu is meeting leaders of Afeni Fere days after the attack on Oyo State Secretariat by a group of Yoruba nation agitators. Although no mention of the attack is made in the presence of cameras, the president and his guests interact on a wide range of issues of national importance, including the security situation in the country. President Tinubu declares that his government has made significant progress in the fight against insecurity. We have degraded terrorism to a level that they could not threaten the sovereignty of this country any longer. The banditry kidnapping that they've resorted into will also be defeated. Those that might thought they can threaten the sovereignty of this country we have themselves to blame. They have a price to pay. However, the leadership of Afeni Ferre is asking the president to address what it terms as inequity in the command structure of security agencies in the country. Afeni Ferre is in support of the campaign of state for state police. We believe this will enhance the security of life and property. We also want your excellency to look at the command structure of federal security agencies to ensure equity and justice in the posting and deployment of senior officers. Equity should also reflect in the recruitment of security personnel from the bottom up. It is not good for the future of our country if one section or a few sections of the country have some of the security agencies as it were, in their pockets. The group commends the president for his achievements so far, including the reconstruction of the Thold mainland bridge and works on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, among other interventions. It pledges its support to the administration of President Bola Tinubu as it promises to soon submit a proposal on a national apprenticeship program that will take millions of youths off the streets. From the presidential villa, Emperor Simon, Channels, Television News. The World Bank President Mr. Ajay Banga has been speaking about the need for African leaders to address energy access gaps. He emphasized private sector investment, effective government policies, and collaboration with multinational agencies to improve electricity supply. Mr. Banga highlighted these strategies at the Energizing Africa event during the ongoing spring meeting in Washington, D.C. Also present was African Development Bank President Mr. Akiomi Adishino, who committed the bank to connecting over 250 million people in Africa to electricity. Our correspondent Sarah Achimugu reports. The free sun, the sun is free, right? The World Bank President and his colleague at the African Africa, Development Bank right? are meeting to discuss how leaders in the region can help change the fortunes of persons in the region through adequate electricity supply. A report by the World Bank estimates that over half a billion people in sub-Saharan Africa are at the risk of being left without electricity access by 2030, with nearly 400 million of them living in countries subject to fragility, conflict and violence. You know, if you start creating distribution and generation and transmission and all those jobs, but then the downstream impact of that electricity, second, infrastructure, houses, bridges, ports, airports. Third is agribusiness and food, food security. That's a big part of what could generate business uh, jobs. Fourth is tourism. I think the final one is healthcare. Right. You will hear us in the course of this spring meeting talk a great deal about healthcare as well. So I think about these five as enablers, but also as job generators. 
point is, without energy, affordable access to energy, nothing is possible. The president of the African Development Bank is not taking the challenge to connect the people to electricity supply lightly. He is setting an ambitious target to achieve that. We decided that the biggest thing we can do is to do the solar systems in Africa. So we have this big thing called Desert to Power. Mm -hmm. Desert to Power is our boldest effort to power Africa. It is a $20 billion investment. Now, what I will do is that will allow us to have 250 million yeah. people having access in addition. So if you add 50 million to 250 million, that's 300 million. You add that to what Ajay was talking about. You know, we had 550 million. And so we finally will be able to put this behind us. Nigeria is currently facing a challenge with electricity supply. The government and the people are often found seeking alternatives, such as renewable energy supply. This challenge is a further compounded by the recent hike in electricity tariffs. Experts believe that with concerted efforts, the challenge can be surmounted. It's in the best interest of the distribution company um, to collaborate and work with the mini-grid companies to ensure that um, we jointly leverage on each other. I have an existing infrastructure today. The mini grid have other sources to be able to ensure that I can make energy available for underserved or unserved yes. areas. So collaboration is fantastic, is, 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 is important. Think bigger, think better, think bolder is the message here as African leaders are advised to solve the energy challenges in the region. From Washington, D.C., Sarah Chimumu. Channels Television News. Well, that's it from the nation's capital. Is over now to Will Ibong in Lagos for business news. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star eight nine four hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. <laughs> Thank you, Gloria, and welcome to Business News. Now, the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, has announced a reduction in the loan-to-deposit ratio LDR for banks from 65% to 50% as part of its current monetary tightening strategy. This move, outlined in a statement, reflects the CBN's aim to align with a more contractionary policy stance. The adjustment in the LDR, a measure of banks' liquidity, impacts the ability of banks to extend credit to businesses and individuals from depositors' funds. The Nigerian liquefied natural gas, LNMG, has assured of its commitment to supporting the upgrading of health facilities in different hospitals across the length and breadth of the country. The chief executive officer of the company, Philip Nshebila, made this known at its corporate headquarters in Portacourt, the River State's capital, during the signing of Memorandum of Understanding with three teaching hospitals in the country. Healthcare delivery is set to receive a major boost in three regions of the Southeast, South, South, and Northeast. As the management of the Nigeria Liquefied Natural Gas signs MOUs with three teaching hospitals in Anambra, Bauchi, and Delta states at its headquarters in Patakat, the River State capital, under its hospital support program. And after this, there will be that partnership handshake. The Nnamdi Azikiwe Teaching Hospital, Newi, Abubakar Tafawa Balewa University Teaching Hospital, Bauchi, and the Federal Medical Center, Asaba, are all specially chosen to receive new facilities to improve patient outcomes. Many years back, we had decided to look at engineering. And we selected six universities across the country and did projects in those six universities related to engineering. And in the wisdom of the management of the day at that time, they decided it was time to focus on health. This is one of the NLNG's numerous CSR projects, and previous beneficiaries attest to the quality of the facilities. ICU, we had prior to now, it's just a seven-bedded ICU, always oversubscribed. The only really functional one, the only city of Benin, I would say maybe Edo State, we, there's never bed enough for, to look after very critically ill patients. So we decided that we needed a bigger ICU, a 15-bed, which we've done. 
The latest hospitals added to the company's intervention list are pleased to be among the chosen. The LNG is going to construct a very modern and standard oxygen plant with all its ancillary facilities for us. The oxygen plant they are doing for us is oxygen that has the capacity to deliver 90 liters, 90 cylinders a day. And each of those cylinders will be 40 liters. The government alone cannot do everything for us. A lot of demand in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, manpower, in terms of uh, uh, equipment that we need to function very well, need to be complemented. And Energy has done that, and we are happy today we have signed this MOU. Among the facilities being built under the NLNG's hospital support program are an oxygen plant in Newi, a molecular laboratory in Bauchi, and the renovation of the new natal intensive care unit in Asaba. Now, as the first green close for the domestic equities market this week, here's Dominique Wewu with the details. Hello, and welcome to the Stock Market Report. I'm Dominic Iwiwu. After four consecutive negative performances, which started last week, the domestic stock market got a reprieve at the close of midweek trading session today growing by 0.10% to close at 99,909 points. It's just a little bit below the 100,000 points, which we had closed at on yesterday. While the market capitalization rose by about 58 billion naira to close at 56.505 trillion naira. Now, let's take a look at the sectoral performances. The banking counter was the major factor, coming up in the green by 1.01%, thanks to gains from FBN Holding and Fidelity Bank, while some other mid-cap stocks added support. On the other hand, the consumer goods counter ended in the negative territory by 0.05%, while the oil and gas sector remained unchanged. Yesterday, I stated that hopefully the bull will make an appearance, and it just did as the market finished bullish. <laughs> Thank you, Dominic. Let's check out how all the major equities around the world perform today. That's it on business. It's back to Anne for the rest of the news at 10. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thank you, Will. The United Arab Emirates has experienced its largest rainfall since records began 75 years ago. It since it received a year's worth of rain in just 24 hours on Tuesday. 20 people have so far been killed. Here's Sam and Pisa with more international news in Around the World in 5. Good evening and welcome to the channel's studios here in London with your international news around the world in 5. According to unofficial statistics, Russia's military death toll in Ukraine has now passed the 50,000 mark. In the second 12 months on the front line, as Moscow pushed its so-called meat grinder strategy, it found the body count was nearly 25% higher than in the first year. Media outlets, including Media Zone and volunteers, have been counting deaths since February 2022. New graves and cemeteries helped provide the names of many soldiers. More than 27,300 Russian soldiers died in the second year of combat, according to the findings, a reflection of how territorial gains have come at a huge human cost. The overall death toll of more than 50,000 is eight times higher than the only official public acknowledgement of fatality numbers ever given by Moscow in September 2022. Russia has declined to comment. Meanwhile, a Russian missile attack has killed 14 people in the city of Chernihiv in northern Ukraine. That's according to Ukrainian officials. Ukraine's interior minister said there were more than 60 injured in the attack, which hit an eight-story building in a densely populated area. Officials said three missiles had struck close to the center of the city. 
The attack came hours after reports of a Ukrainian strike on a Russian military airfield in occupied Crimea. The United States and European Union say they're looking at imposing further sanctions on Iran after its attack on Israel at the weekend. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has said she expected to take action in the coming days, while EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell said the bloc was working on it. Israel has urged its allies to sanction Tehran's missile program. We don't preview our sanctions tools, but in discussions I've had, um, all options to disrupt terrorist financing uh, of Iran continue to be on the table. As I mentioned, since the start of the administration, um, our sanctions have targeted over 500 individuals and entities connected to terrorism and terrorist financing. Officials say Copenhagen's fire-ravaged former stock exchange, one of the Danish capital's most famous landmarks, must be restored to its former glory. The 400-year-old building was being renovated when the blaze erupted on Tuesday, destroying its iconic spire. In a joint statement, the city's mayor and district mayors said, we cannot do without the stock exchange, and Danish Chamber of Commerce director vowed that it would be rebuilt no matter what. The chamber, which currently occupies the building, described the scenes on Tuesday morning as a terrible sight. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has faced Sir Keir Starmer in the first Prime Minister's questions since the Easter recess, with Angela Rayner and Liz Truss featuring prominently in their Commons exchanges. The former Prime Minister Liz Truss has been busy in the news this week due to the publication of her new book, Ten Years to Save the West. This week, the Prime Minister was asked what he thought her greatest achievement was. <laughs> Well, Mr. Speaker, all I'd say is he uh, ought to spend a bit less time reading that book and a bit and a bit more and a bit more time reading the deputy leader's tax advice. Actor Hugh Grant has settled a privacy case against the publisher of The Sun newspaper, saying he could have faced a bill of up to £10 million even if he had won. The star was suing newsgroup newspapers, claiming journalists had used private investigators to tap his phone and even burgle his house. He said he did not want to accept the enormous sum of money he had been offered to settle, but that a trial was likely to prove very expensive. NGN denied the claims against it. And new figures show Japan seeing record tourist numbers, but other data, including a survey of business sentiment, painted a less encouraging picture for the country's economy. Among the cherry blossoms, business confidence at big Japanese manufacturers and service sector firms slid in April from the prior month, dragged down by cost of living pressures and shaky economic conditions in major market China. The yen's weakening to levels unseen since 1990 during the heyday of the asset-inflated bubble is lifting the cost of imports in a blow to household consumption. However, the country is on course to achieve a government goal of topping the pre-pandemic figure of 32 million annual foreign visitors by 2025, with the January to March quarter seeing a record 8.56 million visitors. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos. Thanks, Simon. In the world of sports, Rafael Nadal suffered his first defeat on his return to tennis after injury. Uh, he fell 7-5, 6-1 against uh, Alex Di Minoro in the Barcelona Open second round. The 22-time Grand Slam winner is back on court uh, this week after three months on the sidelines and battled well, but eventually crumbled against the hard-working Australian. The Champions League German side Bayern Munich and Real Madrid have booked their place in the semi-finals of the Champions League. Bayern beat Arsenal 1-0 in the Allianz Arena in the second leg of the quarterfinals. And of course, 14 times uh, ch champions, Real Madrid advanced to the last four after winning the two-legged tie on penalties 4-3. The game ended. That's Sports News. It's back to Anne. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. And the main news again. Former governor of Kogi State today escaped EFCC dragnet after hours of siege late to his Abuja residence. <laughs>
Hello and welcome to your brand and enterprise show, Kaleidoscope, right here on Channels Television. Well, it's great to have you join us again on the program. I'm Anne Mwawadu. 